Good afternoon. I'm Leela Bed, director of the Mexico Institute, and it is my pleasure to welcome you all to the Wilson Center. On June 2nd, Mexico voted overwhelmingly for Claudia Sheinbaum to become the first female president of the country's history. She won nearly 60% of the popular vote, 6% more than Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador obtained in 2018. The political coalition led by the Morena Party secured commanding majorities in both houses of Congress and won seven of the nine governorships up for election. In fact, the governing party's coalition now controls 24 of Mexico's 32 states. A month before leaving office, former President López Obrador used the governing party's majority in Congress to approve constitutional reforms, including the judicial reform and the reform to officially place the National Guard under the Ministry of Defense. Claudia Sheinbaum took office on October 1st, and many questions remain as to what her grip of power will look like now that AMLO is gone, and how she will use the immense power that is concentrated in the executive branch. Sheinbaum's 100-point government plan signals continuity from her predecessor's administration, but also includes important potential shifts in the energy sector, in the digital space, on security, and other areas. Today's discussion will focus on what we can expect from Sheinbaum's six-year term and the future of U.S.-Mexico relations. The Wilson Center, many of you know, is congressionally chartered, scholarly driven, and fiercely nonpartisan. Our panelists today will delve into the political climate in Mexico and Sheinbaum's policies on trade, migration, and security, and will offer views of the future of the U.S.-Mexico bilateral relationship. We are truly lucky to be joined by two former U.S. ambassadors to Mexico, Anthony Wayne and Roberta Jacobson, and two former Mexican ambassadors to the United States, Martha Barsena and Arturo Sarukan to discuss all these pertinent issues. Before we begin, I want to go over a couple of housekeeping items. Towards the end of today's panel, we will take questions from our audience. In-person attendees can just raise their hand and a microphone will be uh, brought to you. For those of you who join us online, if you would like to submit a question to our panelists, please send them to our X account at Mexico Institute or to our email, mexico at wilsoncenter.org. As many of you may have seen, there are beverages and food outside the auditorium for all of you to enjoy. We just kindly ask that you refrain from bringing any drinks or food into the auditorium. As always, I want to thank the incredible team at the Mexico Institute for their hard work to make this event successful. I will now briefly introduce our four speakers. You can, you can find their complete bios on the Mexico Institute's website. Ambassador Tony Wayne is a public policy fellow at the Wilson Center and co-chair of the Mexico Institute's advisory board. He served as U.S. Ambassador to Argentina, Deputy U.S. Ambassador to Afghanistan, and U.S. Ambassador to Mexico from 2011 to 2015. Ambassador Martha Barsena served as the first female Mexican ambassador to the United States from 2018 to 2021. She previously served as Mexico's permanent representative to UN agencies based in Rome. Ambassador Roberta Jacobson is the founding, I was going to say the founding father, which is weird. The founding partner, that's kind of nice though, um, is the founding partner of Dinamica Americas. She served as a U.S. ambassador from, to Mexico from 2016 to 2018 and previously served as the Assistant Secretary of State for Western Hemisphere Affairs from 2012 to 2016. And Ambassador Arturo Sarukan is an international strategic consultant and the former Mexican ambassador to the U.S. from 2007 to 2013. He's a distinguished visiting scholar at the University of Southern California's Annenberg Public Diplomacy School and adjunct professor at George Washington University Elliott School of International Affairs. And he is also a digital diplomacy pioneer. Thank you again to each of you for joining us today. And I will kick it off with Ambassador Sarukan. Um, let me start with you and, and let me ask you, I will be moderating and I will be sitting down in a second. Um, but let me start by asking you, what is your view of Mexico's current political climate? And how do you foresee that it will impact Claudia Sheinbaum's administration? So a big question, but we can all chime in here um, after your remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Leela, um, and it's a distinct pleasure, pleasure to be uh, at the Mexico Institute with three of my dear esteemed colleagues, uh, two of them uh, with whom I worked during my tenure as ambassador. Um, I sense I'm getting the loaded question here. <laughs> uh, you sense correctly. Look, I think there's still a lot of question marks. We're in the early days of a new administration. I think we're still waiting to see who the real 
Claudia Sheinbaum is in terms of not not what her ideological underpinnings are, because I think those are pretty clear to those of us who followed her for some time, but certainly as to how she will use this inv very impressive electoral mandate, um, the super majorities in uh, Congress and in in uh, in the Senate, and. <laughs> More interestingly, the shadow that looms from Tabasco uh, over at least, certainly I believe, the first initial years of her administration. Um, I'm not going to lie, I'm concerned. Uh, I do think that Mexico uh, has seen a very serious deterioration of its democratic foundations in the last six years. I'm extremely worried about the potential effects of the judicial reform, though we're waiting to understand what the secondary or implementing legislation regarding this reform will look like. That will be, I think, a telling signal of where the president uh, is going to, um, is, is headed, because if there is an effort via implementing a secondary legislation to tweak some of the most dangerous, toxic issues of the judicial reform, um, then that might give us a pretty good sense as to how she's going to start using um, the immense power that she can amass and that she can marshal. So that, that's one issue that we're going to be looking at closely. Um, the second one, obviously, is the budget. Uh, she has to get a budget submitted and approved uh, in the next couple of months. And that budget will give us a sense, given the very significant financial, fiscal, economic challenges that this government will face um, when the rubber hits the road. A lot of the policies that made the López Obrador administration extremely popular, effective with important chunks of Mexican society, um, those resources are not going to be there. So something has to give. And so that budget uh, will give us a pretty good sense of where those priorities lie, whether there will be adjustments um, fine-tuning to some of those programs, which so far she has, prom she has doubled down on as mainstays of her government. And then we also have, I think, a very telling signal in the uh, public security strategy that was unveiled just today, the, the strategy for the first 100 days. It's not a full-blown six-year-long strategy, um, but it is the uh, public strategy that they will implement in the first 100 days. And there are encouraging signs and there are very troubling signs in this 100-day uh, strategy. Encouraging because I think, I sense, it's, it's hard to tell, but at least if, if, I, if I'm reading correctly, the language that is used in the presentation that was made unveiled today, there seems to be an emphasis on harm reduction as the core driver of the public security strategy which in my view, and knowing Omar Garcia Harfuch, may suggest that finally a government may be willing, they haven't done it explicitly yet, but may be willing to say something that many of us have advocated for a long time, which is you have to come, and Tony and I, and Roberta and I particularly have talked about this, um, you have to come out and say, yes, we're going to go against the most violent of criminal organizations operating in Mexico. Uh, Madam President, does that mean that you're not going to pursue this and this and this cartel? Yes, that's what it means. I'm going to go against the most violent groups, which probably today I think most would agree is Jalisco Nueva Generación. That means that that is it's sort of the Chinese uh, uh, metaphor of the nail that sticks out the furthest. That's the first one that you bang down. If there is a pivot to a harm re reduction, harm mitigation strategy, that could be a good sign in terms that they've understood that some of the strategic objectives and the tactics need to be completely rethought and retinkered with. The bad sign is that in the strategy, there's not a single mention, not a single mention or nod or wink to the need to enhance, resurrect, rebuild collaboration, intel sharing with the United States in the fight against organized crime. And the fact that there isn't even a cursing mention of enhance our collaboration with the U.S. is, is a very, in my, in my view, is a troubling sign 
that we may see a rehash of a strategy or a policy more than a strategy that has been so prevalent these past six years of the Lopes Obradorato, which was, yes, we sort of embrace the economic and trade relationship with the United States, but when it comes to the security, law enforcement, intel sharing, relationship with the United States, with a 10-foot pole. And so I, I, I found that a bit surprising today to not even see that mention in the strategy. Um, so again, a lot of questions, but I am profoundly worried. I think there is a serious democratic degradation. I think we're back in many ways to the single party hegemonic rule of the, day, of the glory days of the PRI. We're back in that same type of system, in, those, in that same type of symbol, political symbolism. Um, but again, I think it's still a bit too early to understand where exactly is all of this going to play out and how the president is going to tweak, fine-tune uh, her policies. Now, uh, the question that brought us here today, which is how does all of this impact the U.S.-Mexico bilateral relationship, at the end of the day, the critical question isn't how Claudia Sheinbaum and her foreign policy team design and structure relations with the United States. At the end of the day, the most determinant um, trigger of what that relationship is going to look like is what happens here on November 5th, because either a Harris win or a Trump win is going to have a very different impact on the dynamics, the muscle tone, and the way the Mexican government responds and reacts to a Harris or a Trump administration. If Harris wins, give or take, I think we're going to see more or less some of the same dynamics, some of the same priorities that we've seen so far. If Trump wins, the danger that I see is that um, Sheinbaum will be probably put into a position of a reactive policy towards the United States, more than a proactive strategic design. And, and it could make for some very interesting and, and uh, dysfunctional times going forward. So at the end of the day, the question as to what is Mexico's foreign policy towards the United States going to look like, I think is going to be predict. We, we will get a better sense of this once we know what happens here on November 5th, because the, uh, both scenarios can have a very different impact on the muscle tone and the direction of the relationship. And I'll stop there for the time being. Thank you, Ambassador. And you touched upon a lot of issues that we will get to um, in a couple of minutes as well. And happy for any of you to react at any point. Um, but Ambassador Bars and I kind of want to touch upon one of the biggest topics, right, on the U.S.-Mexico bilateral agenda, and that's trade. As we know, Mexico, as of last year, is now the U.S.'s top trading partner, and the USMCA review is going to happen mm -hmm. in 2026. I know that you mm -hmm. assisted very closely on the negotiations that set the foundations for the USMCA. So I would love to get your thoughts, your vision of what Shane Baum's policies are on trade and how you foresee U.S.-Mexico relations um, unfolding on this, on this subject. Yes, of course, of course, Lila. Well, I think uh, Claudia Sheinbaum has not defined a very precise trade policy, except for the uh, s say what she said e in her speech that she doesn't want to compete. Mexico does not want to compete with Canada or the U.S., but it wants to continue to cooperate. But having said that, when you, if, if you attended any of the s different seminars where Altagracia Gomez Sierra was present, and this, and uh, Marcelo Ebrard, what he has been saying, this, the Secretary of Economy, is basically that they are betting that the future of the US Mexico relations on trade and investment will be based on nearshoring, on attracting more nearshoring. And I'm a bit worried about that because uh, following the U.S. debate and what are we going to see in the review of USMCA, I see more of a trend in the U.S. towards reshoring and not necessarily nearshoring, towards emphasis on a protectionist trade policy in the U.S. to uh, re-attract investment to the U.S., and not necessarily speaking of a North American nearshoring. And, uh, and you see that even with all the measures that are being taken regarding the automotive sector, which is the backbone, was the backbone of NAFTA, and is still the backbone of USMCA. 
And uh, uh, so uh, this is what worries me, that the main strategy of, of uh, Claudia Sheinbaum's government is to bet almost everything on nearshoring, on attracting investment to Mexico. And uh, this seems not to be reading correctly the trends in the US, both in the Republican and the Democratic Party. For different reasons and with a different agenda, uh, with a different emphasis, but towards more reshoring and with the big elephant in the room, which is China. Chinese investments in Mexico, in infrastructure, in telecom, in the automotive sector, uh, electric vehicles, which are not covered by USMCA, the rules of origin are not applicable to electric vehicles. So we don't know how are we going to negotiate or not, what would be the rules of origin for electric vehicles. But even the Chinese participation in the auto parts market, because now if you see the Mexican trade statistics, uh, of course, Mexico has a huge deficit with China that it's basically covered by the superavit with the U.S. <laughs> and, uh, and the Chinese presence in the automotive sector has been growing in the last years, particularly in auto parts. So this is something that uh, puts a lot of question marks on how, um, on how uh, Claudia Sheinbaum and, and, and her team are going to define more specifically the issue of nearshoring and trade, particularly in the automotive sector, and in other areas in which, for now, Mexico has not been playing with the US. For example, the Critical <coughs> Minerals Partnership. We are not part of the Critical Minerals Partnership, which we should be now part. The second thing is, how are we going to play with the US and Canada on the issue of artificial intelligence, on the new areas that are not covered by USMCA that we will have to address in the review and possible in, a, in some other instruments to complement USMCA. And, and, and I, why do I say this? Because I was even recently asked by Canadians and said, how do you think we should negotiate or ask the US, which are your red lines with China? We have to understand which are the red lines of the US regarding China's investments and China's presence and China's trade with Mexico. And, uh, and, and, and this Canadian uh, guy was telling me and saying, we don't know exactly how to approach the issue of artificial intelligence and the new areas with the US and within USMCA. And I was thinking just aloud, the US has already a dialogue with the European Union on this. So why don't we widen that dialogue to Canada and Mexico? But then it will be like the whole Western thing. So first, the, the Claudia, the Claudia Sheinbaum's government is putting most of its uh, objectives on near shoring. That's why they say they are going to establish new industrial parks, industrial corridors. And, uh, and I am afraid that to put all the eggs on the basket of nearshoring might be wrong. We have to be ready to understand the trend towards reshoring in the US. Second, uh, it's how are we going to frame what it will start in 2025 in US Congress? And it will depend, as Arturo said, who wins November the 5th, not only presidential, but who gets the control of Congress because all the review process will start in Congress in 2025. The USMCA text is very clear. It says review, but there are already a lot of people talking about renegotiation. So should Mexico's strategy could be to open to renegotiation immediately? I personally don't think so. I think we should insist with Canada on a review, but also we have to have different scenarios. The review can be, uh, can have at the end a laundry list of pending issues in which, uh, of course, there's agriculture, of course, there is energy, of course, there's rules of origin on electric vehicles, and of course, more and more, is the judicial reform and the autonomous organs. So how these reforms in Mexico will impact the core, the spirit of USMCA. And if we have to be ready that even before the negotiation 
between Mexico, U.S., or among Mexico, U.S., and Canada, we need to know what will be the content of the U.S. Trade Representative Report to Congress and how Congress is going to have the public hearings and how is it going to, how these public hearings are going to be. Should there be uh, a participation of Mexican academics, of Mexican businessmen? And what worries me is another thing. The actual, the current government of Claudia, Claudia Sheinbaum do not have trade experts. N there is no, not even one trade negotiating expert in the Claudia Sheinbaum team. Not in economia, not in, uh, not in relaciones exteriores, maybe one expert who is seated here in agriculture, Carlos Vasquez, the only one. We don't have human capital for the review and renegotiation with this current government. Is there human capital in Mexico? Yes. There is a lot of very bright people. The problem is that most of them are considered neoliberals. So are they going to be asked to help Mexico's position, to help the Mexico's negotiation position? So um, I think those are my main worries in the issue of trade and how I see the weaknesses and at the same time the strengths of Claudia Sheinbaum's government uh, position yeah. on trade and investment. Thank you, Ambassador. <clears throat> Ambassador Jacobson, migration has been at the forefront of the bilateral relationship. Um, what, do you, what do you foresee in terms of Sheinbaum's migration policies? What do we know so far? Um, and how do you see that playing out um, in regards to the United States? Mm -hmm. Well, um, thank you, Lila, and, and um, thanks to my fellow panelists who are also good friends. Um, I think there's a couple things that I would say. First of all, it, it is not easy to ascertain exactly what uh, the president, uh, President Scheinbaum's um, policies are going to be on migration to the extent that we look be beyond or, or separately. Um, at the issue of things that occur at the border or even in Mexico, whether in cooperation or separately from the United States, versus an area that she has spent a fair amount of focus and attention on in the first few days, which is the situation of migrants from Mexico in the United States, um, largely focusing on the undocumented population. There is a an increasing, I would say, an increasing focus on the economic importance uh, of those migrants and the jobs that they do in the United States. Um, and I would almost say a return to the kind of heroic language about migrants um, in the United States that actually I think had receded slightly under Lopez Obrador, in part because of a very transactional nature of the relationship when when Donald Trump was president. Um, so I think that we have heard what she would like to do in protecting Mexicans in the United States and the network of consulates in, in the US of pointing out to the United States and, and uh, others the important economic role that those migrants play, but not as much about what Mexico is will be prepared to do about the phenomenon of migration either through Mexico, to Mexico, at the border, et cetera. And that, I think, is, is still to be defined. Um, I think there's probably a, a little bit, as Arturo said, a little bit of a distinction in how the Mexican government will approach this issue depending on the results of the US election. Um, there's been a good deal made of the fact that the border security bill that was up in the U.S. Congress earlier this year really, I think, in so many ways is a reflection of the fact that the debate in the United States has moved to the right. Um, the fact that Democrats were willing to support that bill um, is something you would not have seen a few years ago, right? Um, because it had in it um, an enormous number of significant border security issues, whether that was more border patrol being hired or more um, 
immigration judges. Um, but it also would have expanded legal immigration. And I think that's an important feature of it as well. I also think that, you know, there's an assumption. I, I said this recently in something, and I want to be careful how I say this, but there is an assumption that if Claudia Sheinbaum, Sheinbaum is dealing with a female US president, that sort of automatically they will get along on everything. I find that really an unfortunate conclusion to reach, not because I don't hope that they do. If that's the case, I certainly hope they would get along. But the assumption that two women in power must, by, by definition, uh, be better able to get along than, than if one of them were male, I think, is vaguely sexist, actually, um, it, because it sort of presumes a, a softness that I don't think anybody would uh, actually confuse Claudia Sheinbaum for being sort of a, a, a soft touch on some of these issues. Um, and I think that given what Mexico is confronting with very different demographics in migrants who go through Mexico or remain there, it is a very different phenomenon than when we were looking at Northern Triangle countries being the overwhelming majority of those migrants. Um, I think it is, for example, it may not be telling, it may not be indicative. We're starting from a very low base, but one of the migrant groups, if you will, uh, recently um, found by, by the Mexican government um, was from Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, I can't remember where else. They, they, I think there was maybe one Guatemalan in that group of like 30 or something. Mm -hmm. So again, the composition is changing. And, and again, when you're looking at migrants either from Africa or from Asia, they tend to have started from a very low base, but those numbers are growing more rapidly. Mm -hmm. The percentage increase is much larger than in some other areas. And so that presents a very different conundrum for the Mexican government um, mm -hmm. in that how do you repatriate people from countries with whom you may not have an embassy or you have diplomatic relations, but not <laughs> all of them have embassies in Mexico. You have to get documentation, et cetera. So I, I think the other thing that I would just say about that's, that border security bill in the United States is there is among some, I think, an assumption that because the debate has moved to the right, because um, uh, Vice President Harris has been so forceful in her defense of that legislation, that in fact the positions on migration that will be brought to the, the new Mexican government are much more similar than in fact they are. They're, they're really pretty different. Um, and we can talk about that a little bit later, but I think when you look at what each candidate points to as prospective resolutions or, or policies, they, they are dramatically different. And that will, I think, as Arturo said, have an effect on how the relationship <laughs> is managed. The one thing we can say for sure is migration will remain a central part of this bilateral relationship, regardless of what happens in the U.S. in November. Thank you. Ambassador Wayne, um, Ambassador Shah Khan sort of alluded that, to this in, in, in his remarks, but security cooperation, I think, um, is at an all-time low um, between Mexico and the United States. We do have a new bicentennial framework um, that replaced the Merida Initiative, but there seems to be uh, the possibility that Claudia Sheinbaum will differ in terms of her security strategy, sort of distance herself from the hugs, not bullets strategy of her predecessor. Um, what, is, what is your take on, on what her security strategy looks like, on what we heard this morning <coughs> in terms of what um, Secretary Harfush, Garcia Harfush presented, um, and what that looks like also for U.S.-Mexico security cooperation in the near future? Well, that's a tough question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think that the the basic outlines of cooperation with both sides, I think, trying to, um, I, th I think I, I would say, manage the dynamic so it not get ex extrapolated and not become a point of great difference between the two. 
is going to remain um, important going going forward. And so I think there will be one a tendency to try to keep the dialogue within certain bounds. There'll be a lot of pressure on both sides. You're going to get a lot of people probably speaking out, especially on the U.S. side, in the next few months coming in the election um, to demand uh, more from Mexico. Uh, maybe that is possible. Um, but I think that you will find that most of the official commentary will be trying to keep trying to keep this limited so saying yes there are challenges um, yes we've got to have, we'll have problems dealing with it but we've got to try to manage that now whether or not that can be um, maintained throughout this period will be really the test and there'll be certain people pushing I think from both angles to try to uh, get it um, e exaggerated um, not to the degree of having a blow up, but to the degree of making clear that, that this is a much more serious issue than uh, the governments have um, recognized and have taken on. But I think that what you'll probably see is an effort by both the Democrats to be um, tougher in the sense of responding to any uh, challenges coming from the Mexican side and show that they are going to be, uh, I, I guess I would say, um, firm in their stance. And then you're going to see the Republicans and Republican spokespersons saying that you need to be uh, even firmer and to, uh, to sort of press for more activity on the Mexican side. So I think you'll see that sort of on the US side, both, uh, both parties pressing hard on Mexico. And it's, there's really a question as how Mexico is going to respond to that. I would assume they're going to try to say that they will be uh, as tough as is, is needed to maintain the uh, current situation um, and wait to get through this period of elections. But we're just going to have to see what happens. Um, the, I, th I think that there's enough uh, turmoil in Mexico that that's going to um, take a lot of, in this very short period, will take a lot of the attention away from the bilateral aspect of this as different, as different parts of the Sinaloa cartel, who's going to dominate in that cartel, what other cartels might you know, move up and in, in, in take uh, the, the place of Sinaloa in certain aspects of sh having uh, channels open to go to the United States or not. So we're, we're going to see a bit of that, but I, I think generally most people will agree to try and keep that as low as possible during this election period because even though they're not always the most... Uh, um, clever in managing their overall strategy. They're usually pretty good at seeing when is not a good time to uh, stick your head up uh, too high, that there's a lot of people aiming for that right now. So I, I think that the, um, you'll see both of the main groups trying to stay um, at a lower level of activity. Um, but there will still be instances that people will jump on, I think, from the north. And I think that's what we're going to see in the, in the intermediate is a lot of attention to any um, efforts by cartels to either expand their influence or expand their sales into the United States. So I, I, you know, I think we'll see a continued effort to be sending uh, things to the U.S., but not a large effort to expand that um, that trade um, in the near future. I think people are going to be careful and see what happens because they're going to be wary uh, to, of, of what can happen to them. Now, that doesn't change the fact that both sides need to come up with a better uh, set of proposals than they've had recently on how to work together to deal with that problem going forward. And I think that is a serious difference that will need to be sorted out, either with the Harris campaign and the, the sort of the government that is right now, or the uh, the Trump campaign and the government that would like to be, 
I think the Trump uh, effort and the uh, effort from the Republicans will be to show uh, what hasn't been done well and to offer that there needs to be a much more forceful approach. And um, they'll be using uh, various methods they can, they can devise to create more pressure on the current Mexican government to come down on, um, against the cartels. And I think the, the government um, uh, right now and those uh, people working with them are going to press for continued solid pressure on the government through the normal channels and believe that they can get a better degree of cooperation from Mexico in doing that. Now we'll just see what, who prevails in this argument and uh, what kind of a, of, of a pattern of cooperation um, develops in the months ahead. Ambassador Jacobson, did you have your? Yeah, uh, yeah, please. Okay, there's there's two points I wanted to make. One mm -hmm. one's about security. One's about trade. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, on security, I, I think there's there's two things that that are important to remember. And the first one is, you know, Arturo, you started by saying that they're likely to go after the Scheinbaum government is likely to go after. Uh, CJNG um, no, that, that in my view the, is most the most violent, violent. and if that well, is the policy that that's the one that they would go after the the problem with that I would posit which is very different than any other cartel in Mexico and and any other cartel that we've seen frankly in in this region thus far is that CJNG's model was completely different when it first came into being, obviously beginning out of, of Jalisco, Nayarit to some extent. Um, because I would liken it, frankly, to Papa John's franchises, not, not in the damage they do. Let me say that. I don't, I don't want to get in trouble with businesses. <laughs> but what CJNG did was they went from being prevalent in two states to being nationwide in an incredibly rapid Fact. time frame. Mm -hmm. And the way they did that was to go into parts of Mexico and say, you, los rojos o los quien, um, you are running the operation here now. We don't have any problem with you running it, but now you work for us. And if you don't work for us, then all hell breaks loose. And so in doing that, they, they amass territory much faster. But what that also means is who are you going after? Because unlike in some cases, certainly what we saw in Colombia, but, but at, at some times in Mexico too, going after the head of CJNG or the high value targets, a, a phrase I've always hated, um, which to be honest, Mexican governments and U.S. governments have been trying to do for, for years now, but even if you could get those at the very top, it won't all collapse because it's franchises, okay? So that's, that's the first thing. The, the second thing I wanted to say is really sort of political and trade, and that's, there has been a lot of, um, I have seen academic and other arguments recently about Mexico should essentially not be forced to choose U.S. or China, but utilize a sort of a triangulation strategy to have leverage with either one to do better for, them, for themselves, for Mexico. The problem with that, to be honest, is that Martha, I think, correctly talked about a tendency towards or a preference in the U.S. towards reshoring, not nearshoring, but there is one part policy in the U.S. Um, Congress or in Washington in general that is truly bipartisan these days, and that is China, mm -hmm. right? Everybody's yeah. playing, you'll excuse me, quien es mas macho on China. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the notion that the U.S. being confronted with a kind of a triangulation strategy exactly. and using that as leverage, yeah, no. I, it, it isn't going to work no, is the only thing I would say. So, yeah. you know. Yep. Yeah. I agree. No, I, I fully agree with that. Um, I, I, I think there's, um, there's some Panglosian thinking going on in Mexico these days, particularly coming from the private sector, I must say, that sort of somehow Mexico can have its cake and eat it too. Uh, 
Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think that given that this city, as Roberta says, uh, has um, bipartisan agreement, I would add another one, and both have to do with Mexico, one's China, the other one's fentanyl, mm -hmm. where there is an alignment between Democrats and Republicans on policies that need to be pursued, and both have to do one more, the other one less, but both um, uh, sort of have China and Mexico um, uh, in, 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 the, in the ecosystem. Um, I, I, I don't think it's going to fly. Uh, I, th I, think, I think Mexico is trying to be cute. Um, I think Mexicans haven't figured out that, as Roberta says, as Marta says, Mexico's competition for nearshoring isn't Malaysia, Vietnam, Singapore, India. It's Texas. That's Mexico's competition for nearshoring. And so how do we build a paradigm that can take advantage of the unique historical opportunity, geostrategical? I've never seen an opportunity. in my yeah. 20 years plus as a diplomat and Kitty Winky studying international relations, that was even before then, um, two strategic opportunities that Mexico has had in the international arena, like the decision to negotiate NAFTA and what understanding how to take advantage of what is the most important recalibration of U.S. foreign policy since the end of the Cold War, which is relation to the relationship with China. How does Mexico take advantage of that? And, and I, I think most Mexicans in government, outside government, in academia, in the private sector, have simply not understood this. And I, I had a very relevant discussion the other day with a company that I, a client that I cannot name, but the whole debate was, you know, how can we convince the U.S. and how can we convince our government that they need to pay attention to how we develop near shore? And my pitch was, and that's why I sort of also mentioned the issue of security and the lack of, men of any mention to the relationship with the United States, because for me, secure, when I talk about security in the U.S.-Mexico relationship, I'm not talking just about drugs and thugs. No. I'm talking about intel sharing, the type of paradigm that we developed post 9-11 right. that North completely America. changed the relationship between yeah. our two right. countries. Yeah. And what Mexico and Mexicans need to understand is nearshoring just because we've got lower wages, we've got 52, I, I've lost the count, ports of entry along our common border because we're geographically located next to one another because we've got the USMCA. That's not enough. We need to rethink the role that Mexico plays in cybersecurity, common domain awareness in North America, and that means everything from who flies into Canadian, Mexican, and U.S. airports, as we do on a, on a, on a given basis, on a daily given basis, but it also means that we have to have cybersecurity protocols in Mexico that are remotely similar to the ones that Canada and the U.S. have. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not in the private sector and they're not in the public sector. Um, and that, you know, if you go about poking your finger in the eye of the United States every time you can and your positions on Ukraine and Hamas and Venezuela and Cuba and Nicaragua, the ones that the previous government articulated, this whole spiel about, oh, it's really not about nearshoring, it's French shoring or ally shoring precisely because of how this concept is morphing and changing in Washington, that's going to be a huge, huge missing piece. And the second one, obviously, which has been the other big challenge of the outgoing administration, and which I think, despite uh, President Sheinbaum's underscoring that she will privilege renewables, um, again, you can't have your cake and eat it too unless you're the baker. And last time I saw, neither Mexico nor Claudia Sheinbaum are the baker. The only way that you can privilege renewables if you stop uh, seeking to ensure that Pemex and CFE are the predominant players when it comes to energy generation and delivery in Mexico. So, but the, where I was headed is the other important pillar of all of this is energy. Mm -hmm. And unless we can develop a common paradigm for energy security, energy independence, energy efficiency, energy resilience, sustainability in North America with our two Canadian and U.S. partners, the whole nearshoring phenomena is not going to materialize. Yes, there will be some investment coming in simply because of the fact that we, you know, I, I still remember a Mexican president, the first Mexican president that went to Singapore to meet Lee Kuan Yew, the architect of the Singaporean miracle. And in the brief minutes that 
preceded their formal bilateral conversations. Lee Kuan Yew asked this Mexican president, Mr. President, remind me how many kilometers of border does uh, Mexico share with the United States? And this Mexican president, without thinking, immediately said, unfortunately, 3,000 kilometers. Lee Kuan Yew looked at him, scratched his bald spot, looked at the president and said, Mr. President, what would Singapore give for one kilometer of a border with the United States? So yes, geographic uh, proximity is important. It's going gonna, it's gonna to drive relatively important levels of investment. But the seismic shift that everyone thinks could take place and that this Mexican government could capitalize is going to come to naught unless we understood, understand that these two pillars, security and an energy paradigm for North America, need to be piece and parcel of the strategy. Ambassador Barcelona. Yes, I would like to uh, compliment what has been said uh, regarding part migration, part security, and also trade and the review of USMCA. I think the, the word that we are missing now, which is key for the future, is trust. Mm. Trust has been eroding between Mexico and the US. In security, it was badly hit by the detention of General Cienfuegos and now by the rendition, capture, what you, whatever you call it, of Zambada and the Guzmans. So we don't have trust. So the first thing we have to do is to build confidence building measures mm -hmm. and to recognize that security is not only fentanyl and drug trafficking, but it is also illicit traffic of people. People from Nepal, Pakistan, Africa would not be arriving to Mexico without the help of traffickers. They do not come naturally. We have to understand that. So we should prioritize in these confidence building measures the fight against illicit traffic of people, which is now giving more money than the illicit traffic of drugs. And, uh, and we have to stop what was used is to use the migrants as an exchange coin with the US. No, human rights have to go back as a priority in migration to defend human rights of the migrants. To, we cannot allow that a person like Francisco Garduño continues to be in the government after 40 migrants were killed in a fire in Ciudad Juarez. Mm -hmm. He should be, if not in jail, prosecuted. at least, yes, prosecuted. So I think we, we need to establish like a, a list of confidence building measures. When I arrived to the US, and uh, Arturo knows this well, we were 220 people at the embassy of all the, of all the ministries. And we had people at the National Targeting Center. And we had people collaborating with the Department of Justice. Slowly and steadily, the Mexican government cut them all. And at the National Targeting Center, there were only 12 polices. And there were many captures of drugs and these because there were Mexican people at the National Targeting Center. So we need to reignite again that collaboration. We need to build trust again. And we have the opportunity now with the new scheme that Claudia Sheinbaum has a sign with a, with a person like Omar Garcia Harfuch that understands. So he may be able to send some of his people again to the US to cooperate, to exchange this intelligence information. And, and we need to do the same in each one of the areas. So I think in, in I have listened very carefully to Kamala Harris. She puts a lot of emphasis in illicit traffic of people. Huh? Mm -hmm. She knows that. And, and I'm sure that in the Trump administration, and I know there were all also there were people that putting a lot of attention on illicit traffic of people. So we need to build that. And that will take us also to understand that we need to upgrade the border security, the ports of entry. One of the things that worries me about this Border Security Act, which it is very, very tough, but it implies a huge investment in technology in the US side of the border. So my question is, who is going to pay for the Mexican side? <laughs> How can we have this same level of technology at the border, of scans of this? How are we going to deal with that? And 
Roberta told me, well, the law is not going to be, the act is not going to be negotiated with Mexico. But after if it's approved, we will have to sit and see how are we going to cooperate on this? How is the US going to help Mexico to upgrade our infrastructure? Because yes, for nearshoring, we need uh, legal certainty, we need the rule of law, we need energy, but we need infrastructure. The 57 ports of entry are completely overwhelmed. They cannot deal now with the trade that we have now, even with nearshoring, even worse. So uh, I think uh, I will start for very simple things like identifying illicit traffic of people as one of our priorities. Second, sending people again from Mexico to the National Targeting Center and to other agencies to, to cooperate. Uh, slowly but steadily, you build confidence again. You have to regain trust in the U.S.-Mexico relations that, unfortunately, we've lost in the last maybe two years, it was even, uh, I think, when, when the decline went even faster. Can I just do yes. a very quick two finger on, on two issues that Marta has just put on the table? The first one is this whole thing about trust. Um, and I'll be very blunt. Lopes Obrador was very fond of saying from the bully pulpit that we can't cooperate if there's no trust between both countries. It's actually the other way around. It's cooperation that delivers trust in the U.S.-Mexico bilateral relationship. Historically, when both countries have collaborated and cooperated, that's what fosters mutual trust and confidence building. It's not the other way around. On the issue of, of uh, the evisceration of the Mexican state and of Mexican agencies, um, we've been sort of talking about the review in 2026, and the painful fact is, ladies and gentlemen, today the Mexican embassy does not have an attaché from the Ministry of Economy. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> so how are we going to negotiate, uh, how are we going to navigate the review of USMCA in 2026 when key ministries on the altar of bureaucratic um, uh, Franciscan um, uh, 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 austerity have been completely gutted and we have the size of an embassy that maybe, if I recall, the last time we had those numbers was pre-NAFTA days. Mm -hmm. So there, there, you know, there, there's a huge gap between reality and, 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 and rhetoric here on a number of issues, Absolutely. and these are two that I wanted to just underscore. Thank you. Not, not economy, not finance, not customs, not education, not environment, yeah. and we need experts energy. We need experts to complement the diplomatic service. Let me ask all of you a, a question that I've received from, from various stakeholders who we work with. And I think kind of looking as an outsider towards Mexico, you see a governing parties coalition that's completely, you know, has the power of all branches of government, not with the judicial reform, right? And so one would naturally think that Claudia Sheinbaum would have overwhelming power to do as she likes. Um, but we know that Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador founded Morena. Um, he was the head for all purposes of Morena. It was sort of the glue that kept it together, at least according to some analysts. And so I want to pose the question, how do you see her governing, right? What are the areas where she's actually going to be able to make a mark of her own? Um, and where are some areas that she might face some challenges? I know it's a big question, um, but I think it's important to sort of understand the dynamics and the different factions within Morena, because I actually believe that Morena might have its opposition inside and not necessarily an, an, an outside opposition with the traditional oppositional party. So I'm um, happy to have any of you respond. Yes, please. Well, I'll start. I totally agree with you. The opposition in Mexico is not the, in the opposition parties, not right now. It's inside Morena. It's inside Morena. And if we make a very simple uh, analysis of Claudia Sheinbaum cabinet, we have one group that has worked with her in the government of Mexico City. The main example is Luz Elena Gonzalez, the Secretary of Energy. Uh, yes. Uh, then you have the radicals of Morena, that uh, were the radicals surrounding President López Obrador. The main example is Jesús Ramírez Cuevas, no, and uh, Víctor Suárez. Then you have the academics that come from the academia or the international organizations like Julio Verdeguea and Alicia Bárcena. Then uh, you have the politicians, 
No, that uh, the main example is Marcelo Ebrard. And then you have maybe a fifth group that can go, can come from, from other parties like the Verde or this. Uh, these, these groups are, are very different and they have different perspectives for Claudia Sheinbaum government and from 2030. And, and, uh, and also happens the same with the governors. It's not the same a governor of Morena in Guerrero, the daughter of Felix Salgado Macedonio, and the governor of San Luis Potosí, who was in jail for six months accused of drug trafficking. He was liberated, but he was in jail for six months. We should not forget that. And then you have some others that are more technocratic, if you want so. so uh, I think that for Claudia Sheinbaum, the main challenge will be to keep more and less under control those different factions. And then the agreement that President Lopez Obrador made with the different candidates for the presidency, <coughs> it's, it's, a big, it's a big challenge for Claudia because each one of them were given a very important position. One as leader of, con of, of the House of uh, Depu Chamber of Deputies, the other as leader of the Senate, the other as Secretary of Economy. So they, the three of them, they have a project on their own that may not be exactly the project of Claudia Sheinbaum. Of course, they all are going to say that they are the Morena project, but who really knows what is the Morena project besides the social programs, which I agree with Arturo. The main question in Mexico and abroad is how sustainable are those programs? Because you need to grow at least 5% a year, and we are growing 0.8% a year to be able to sustain those programs. And with the promise of no fiscal reform, so the question is who is going to pay for those programs if you don't want to get Mexico more indebted? And we already have a debt above 50% of GDP. I know that for US and Europe, that's very low. But you have to remember that up to 10 years ago, the ratio was 30% of GDP, 35% of GDP. And can I ask, uh, like, add an additional item here? Um, what about the revocation of mandate, right? Because that's also coming um, in 27. Um, so what would that mean for her six-year term? I, I'm going to choose not to speak to that, actually, because I, I don't really know. I mean, I, I, it, it was present, obviously, under Lopez Obrador as well. Um, I will say that all of the referenda that we saw in his sexenio did not necessarily conform to the rules for referenda in the Mexican Constitution. So I'm unclear on what rules will be in place or who will get to vote or what will be considered a um, model uh, municipality for, for those. It, but there are two things I wanted to mention, um, picking up on what um, you asked and what, what was said. I've never really thought that the right way to look at where and whether um, Claudia Scheinbaum differs from her predecessor will be sort of sectoral or in particular areas. To me, it's much more temporal. That is, and I think you're, you're beginning to see this, but it is so early it's hard to say, but I think there will be, for lack of a better expression, have to be a decent interval, right, in which I don't think she will diverge much from her predecessor. Um, he's the reason she was the candidate. And, mm -hmm. and I think, you know, that, that it would look like an enormous un ingratitude to turn immediately uh, upon inauguration. That said, I don't know if it waits till midterms or, or it happens sooner, as you say, because she's coming up on the 27 or whatever. Um, but I think there will be two things that, that I think give us some indication, both of which I think um, Arturo mentioned, but I think they're even more important. We've talked about the judicial reform and what may happen with it in the, the implementing legislation. 
or obviously the Supreme Court deciding, the current Supreme Court deciding that they can rule on this before they leave next year at some point. But we also know that the dissolution of the regulatory agencies, which was passed in committee in the old Congress, at least from widely distributed rumor, and I don't know any more than that, it is being shelved for now. It's not being brought to the, to the floor where one assumes that it might pass, and the answer, I think, is it might not, actually. There, there's a little bit more division on that. So that is something, and, and clearly her predecessor had one priority to get through of the 20 reforms, mm -hmm. and that was judicial reform because it is the most, in some ways, consequential, especially to this foreign investment and other things. Um, but the other one that got through, one of the other ones that got through was making the National Guard subordinate to Sedena. And so we have talked about um, her public security secretary and the extraordinary, frankly, job that was done in Mexico City. But the real question is how will he do that job if his entity is subordinate to Sedena? And that gets us back, it seems to me, once again, to the budget, right? Because indeed, in her um, San Lazaro speech, she outlined three new social programs, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Not just the continuation of the old ones. And when we talk about security, if even you're going to go much more aggressively into 10 municipalities, in that first 100 days, you need funds to do that. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, we have always said in the United States, budget is policy, right? Mm -hmm. Where you put your money. But she's going to have a hell of a time funding the kinds of things that she wants to do. And the irony of this is that Mexico was either one of the only or the only G20 countries, which did not have a stimulus program during COVID, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? And part of the rationale for that was not to incur greater debt. debt. Mm -hmm. And yet here we are with a fiscal deficit of 5.9 that her Hacienda secretary has said will be down to 3% by it, within a year. That's really hard to do. Yeah, uh, for, a, for, a, for a man who was always typecast in every single piece of news that came out for six years in the international press, the leftist, the left wing, I always said, look at, look at what he did in the pandemic, and there's no more Thatcherite policy than what López Obrador did in Mexico in terms of economic and social stimuli to confront the effects of the pandemic, so absolutely. Um, the question, you know, to which sort of you're prodding us to wade into, in which I will but won't, at the same time, um, which is, okay, when, when does she, if she does, pivot away from López Obrador? There's, there's another take to that, which is maybe the question is wrong. Maybe the question is, does she need the power of the president to govern at least the beginning of those two, three years because of what's, what Morena looks like and the, and the very diverse, strange bedfellows dynamic in Morena? And so everyone who's asking me, as a consultant, oh, you know, when do you think she's going to pivot away and when does she amass sufficient political power to start, you know, becoming her own woman? Well, m maybe the answer is she doesn't want to because she needs the power of López Obrador. Well, and you also said, Ambassador, she's deeply ideological, yeah. right? So I think that goes to your point. Yeah. So, all right. Um, I think we've covered most, if not most, I, I mean, mm -hmm. I'd love to say most, but there's so much on the bilateral agenda and so much happening in Mexico. But I do want to offer the opportunity for everyone in person um, to ask any question to our incredible group of panelists. Um, they will bring a mic towards you. I do have some questions online, but we'll start with, obviously, our in-person attendees. So, um, oh. um, can you please um, identify yourself, name, and where you um, are coming from? And I apologize for my raspy voice, but I've had this like lingering cough for a while. So, yes. Let me hold one second. Let them. I think it's off. 
we can hear you, but those yeah, online probably exactly. Aren't. If not, you can say, it. oh, there we go, perfect, okay. Good. Merrily, International Trade Today. So my trade-related question is about um, the things that the U.S. has done um, that might be undermining um, Mexican interests in the automotive sector, specifically ignoring the panel decision on rules of origin roll-up. But then also I want to ask what y'all's view is of how the government will respond and or how the automotive sector will respond to the connected vehicles a decision recently because um, Commerce clarified with me this could actually shut down Volvo manufacturing in the U.S. and could shut down Polestar manufacturing in the U.S. So if they're not afraid of that, you know they're not afraid of shutting down uh, Chinese uh, manufacturing in Mexico. So yeah. anything you have to say about those two issues? Why don't, is it okay if we take like a couple questions? Yeah. Okay. I know that there's one in the back. Um, I see Ambassador John Feely over there. Oh, and then we'll go to you. Hi, John Feely. I, uh, my claim to fame is I worked for both Roberta and Tony. Um, <laughs> quick question. Marta, you raised a very good point about trust. And uh, Arturo certainly remembers when a Mexican president once said, trust is something that takes a very long time to earn, but you can lose it overnight. So can I ask each of the four of you, with regards to binational law enforcement cooperation, what is one thing each government could do to begin to rebuild the trust that's clearly shattered in the last sexenio? Thank you. Gracias, Embajador. Yes, over here. Hi, uh, my name is Luz Cumba Garcia. I'm an immunologist by training, a scientist working with the U.S. Department at the Office of Mexican Affairs. Uh, I'm the health officer there. And my question is related to health, actually, and pandemics and outbreaks. Uh, there is a lot going on in the region. Um, how do you foresee the cooperation and the relationship to tackle these pressing issues, given that uh, Shane Baum um, is a scientist, she's an engineer, and she considers herself a, a scientist. So just any comments you have on that. Thank you. Thank you. Just full preference for taking. Do you want to start, Ambassador? I'm not taking the trade uh, my, question. Well, I, can, Ambassador I, can, I think we'll all <laughs> dig into the trade question, and, yes. and that will give us a few seconds to think about good. John's yes. question. Um, well, um, first, on a general basis, I, I will not refer specifically, specifically to the new rule of the U.S. because I have not been following it so closely, but I have been having some conversations with uh, with many experts in the U.S. and and this first, U.S. undermining undermining USMCA. Yes, the U.S. is under, uh, undermining USMCA on not not complying with the uh, with the rule of the panel on rules of origin. And what I've been told is the U.S. will not comply because. One of the things that uh, I have been listening to is that both the Republican and the Democratic Party, let's say, are fighting for the soul of the unions, and particularly for the soul of the Teamsters and the United uh, UAW. UAW. And I can tell you, basically, the USMCA was ratified because there was an agreement between the Democratic Party and the unions. Without that agreement, it shouldn't have been ratified. And it was ratified because Mexico agreed to the rapid mechanism of labor issues. So, so the question that is, and I go back to my first intervention, is in the review process, how are we going to deal with the backbone of USMCA, which is the automotive industry? So are we going to uh, tweak the rules of origin? Are we going to apply the current rules of origin to EV vehicles from China? Uh, and what I have been recollecting in, in the US and with experts is the US will not allow any, any Chinese car produced in Mexico, either EV or traditional combustion engine, into the US. If the Chinese want to establish themselves in Mexico to export for the rest of the world in Latin America, okay, 
not to North America. And I go back then, I don't know if it's true or not, but this is what I've been, you know, recollecting. So that's, I go back to, we have to, even before we start the review process, to sit and say, which are your red lines? Mexico needs to understand how these internal fights in the U.S. Uh, for the soul of the workers, because that will guarantee the vote in the future, are there. How are we going to operate or not? And what will be the margin of maneuver for Mexico? Because uh, if we don't understand that, and we think that we can go as, as saying, but USMCA has been a great success, and the automotive industry is great, it is true. But we have to understand what, which are the limits. The, the limits uh, now. And by national law enforcement, rebuild trust. Uh, John, I would go for the very basic that I said. Just, just return some Mexican officials to be embedded and to be part of these. Uh, just strengthen the embassy with, techni with technicians, with police, with people that are experts on security in customs, in agriculture, and, and, and let them interact with their counterparts. Let them interact with the counterparts. Enhance the embassy. Let them go again to, the, to, to these different institutions. Let, have, let them have daily conversations with the Department of Justice, with uh, arms, tobacco and firearms, with CBP. These don't keep them. Don't keep them inside the embassy. Don't keep them in Mexico. Let them come and go and establish relationship, including in health. Want to take a? I guess I would say two things. Um, one, to to my constant disappointment, I guess is the word or irritation, the U.S., which I think correctly talks about rule, rules based <coughs> international systems, does not always put its money where its mouth is and does not always implement adhere to um, either regional or global body decisions. And that, I think, should change. Um, but I, I think what Martha has said about the importance of labor is crucial here. Um, when we talk about um, one thing each country could do to rebuild trust, I, I do actually agree with Arturo on this also, which is, I know this is going to probably have hoots of derision, but when we created and worked on the Merida Initiative, which I will be among the first to agree failed for lots of different reasons, structural as well as political, when people would ask me, what did you get out of it? Right? What did you, the US, get out of it? And the answer was, which people were not satisfied with either, a habit of cooperation. Yep. A habit of cooperation was the most mm -hmm. valuable thing that in my mind, either side got out of it. It wasn't how much drugs were seized or how many high value targets went to jail in the United States or extraditions. It was the habit of working together, which when there were tensions in the relationship, and there were and always have been, <laughs> survived because those officials working below the heads of agencies, below the presidency, would continue to work with each other quietly, you know, just <laughs> doing their jobs together. Yeah. I, I would like to see us get back to that. But that also requires something that has been lost in the last few years, which is this premise of keeping things in their lanes. If we have a trade dispute, mm -hmm. we deal with it within trade channels. And if we've got a security dispute, that stays within our security. That really got blown up when you do things, for example, like threaten to cut off or to implement graduating tariffs to migration. if migration is not um, dealt with a certain way. And once you blur those lanes and those lines, 
then it, it's a bit of Katie bar the door. Then, then everything is up for grabs mm -hmm. when mm -hmm. one thing is a problem. We have the broadest, and I would argue deepest relationship of any two countries in the world. When I left the U.S. Embassy in Mexico, there were 31 agencies, I think, in the embassy. There are now more, right? From National Fish and Wildlife Service to CDC to IRS to everything you can imagine. You don't want one aspect of problem no matter how serious that problem is, <laughs> to infect the whole rest of the relationship. Um, I didn't even know there was a health officer in WHA MEX, and I'm thrilled because that is exactly the kind of thing I'm talking about. And I think that if you let that cooperation be done by people like you, you might not think an engineer is a is a is a scientist. I, I get that from your perspective, but <laughs> um, but if you let the experts, the technical people, have those relationships, I think you build that trust back. How you get it at the very top is a, is I think a different a different story. But I would hope that having now lived through a pandemic, having lived through you know Zika and SARS before it, and environmental problems, they don't respect boundaries. And the most important thing North America can do, whether within USMCA or outside, is recognize that unless we are, in fact, collaborating on these things, it, it isn't just like a thin line of population at the border who suffers. Everybody does. On, on the issue of, of health and, and the Part of the problem is that the administration that has just left office in Mexico thought that anything that preceded it was bad. Um, and so that's a problem. And it impacted everything from Merida to uh, the work that both countries, in fact, the three North American countries did on pandemics, which served Mexico, Canada, and well, uh, served Mexico, Canada, and the United States extremely well in 2009 when we got hit with H H1N1. I was going to say, H1N1 is absolutely it, it's the, the best text, example. It's the textbook case right. of protocols that were put in place by the three governments knowing that something like this was going to happen. And our ability, of course, H1N1 was never on the scale of, of, of COVID-19. Mm -hmm. But it, it was, it was a serious pandemic. But we didn't know that when we started yeah. out that cooperation. It was a serious pandemic. And we, we have the playbook in place to develop and further deepen collaboration on global public health issues. Uh, on, 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 on Roberta's take on the media, I couldn't agree w with her more. I, I always said that Merida and the success of Merida, in my view, wasn't predicated on seizures, on law enforcement training, on the number of K-9 units that were going into Mexico, uh, on the number of judges that were being trained. And, uh, and, and this is a very important piece, which also has been lost, as I mentioned, judicial training. It wasn't the federal government. It was right. state attorney generals in the US training state attorney generals in Mexico. Mm -hmm. But the importance of Merida is that it allowed for a straitjacket that ensured whole of government approaches on both sides of the border and ensured that different agencies didn't have s separate disparate agendas in their relationship with the neighboring country. What we've seen with the DA, quite frankly, in the past three, four years, is a symptom of that disease. Once you destroy Merida, once you destroy that one-stop shopping air traffic controller system that we had with Merida, Agencies went back to the old modus operandi, which was we work on our own. We do whatever we think is best in, in terms to secure our own specific objectives. Um, on, John's, on John's question, I, I would sort of, given that I know that you specifically asked about this related to sort of law enforcement and, and counter-narcotics collaboration, I would probably say, and I agree, yes, we need to repopulate Quantico and you know we need to send we need to ensure that our presence which I fought hard for and got I didn't quote Quantico. Uh, no uh, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm bringing Quantico into the mix um, but what we did with Northcom for example finally getting Sedena and Samar liaisons in uh, uh, Colorado Springs 
Uh, all this is important, but maybe to respond to your question, I would do something that I think is fundamental, which is both countries very quickly need a common assessment of what our threats and challenges look like. And that means that we both agree on how much fentanyl is being produced, where, how is it coming through. We don't have even the common diagnostic of what our problems are. So creating a tabula rasa or a baseline that we both agree, okay, this is the amount that is being produced and it's coming from here and it's coming through there and it's being exported in these numbers. Let's develop that frame, that analytical baseline framework that we can both agree to. And I can bet that that exercise, which will take some time, will start triggering this type of engagement, trust, collaboration that we've lost. And on the issue of, of, of trade, yeah, it, it's not only about who, who, who captures the soul of the labor movement. Increasingly, the GOP has become the party of, of the blue collar uh, uh, worker in the United States. But it also has to do, obviously, and most presciently, and that's the reason why I think the Biden administration has played um, possum with uh, the decision by the panel on uh, uh, automotive rules of origin, which is, you know, you've got Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin at stake in mm -hmm. less than a month. Mm -hmm. um, it also, I think, the fact that the administration has played possum with this ruling, uh, much to the detriment of making the case that USMCA is a rule-based uh, agreement that everyone abides by. Um, it also has to do, because I think both countries, including Mexico, were sort of calibrating how to play the fact that the Biden administration has not announced whether it will comply or not with the ruling. Why? Because we've got an energy dispute, which USTR has still not pulled the trigger on. Well, exactly. Uh, we've got, yeah, Intentional we, too. we've, yeah, exactly. To avoid those. Businesses. You avoid them, and then, you know, there's a bit of, if he doesn't comply, then I might not comply. But, but the goal was not to have those yep. panels, the, not to have them come to panel or have panel decisions before the election exactly. in either country. And that's why yellow corn got pushed back until now, probably November, when we will have uh, the panel resolve on, on that other Canadian and U.S. Uh, labor, um, uh, trade dispute with Mexico. So there's been a lot of sort of calibration of how to play the different disputes that are ongoing. Uh, and, and that, to a certain extent, has benefited both particularly Mexico City and uh, Washington, D.C., because they both get out of this what they want, at least in this moment in time. Thank you. I think we can take one more question and then we're going to have to close. Maybe two here, Heidi and. Or three. We'll just take three and maybe one of you can answer each. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, sounds good. Is that on? Is it not on? No, it's not on. But. Heidi, I think it is. It is. We have to close it. So, my question is um, if the government coalition is weak, what kind, and we have some suspect on the street is. You know, we can have a Dilma too, well, oh. in Mexico. Um, what kind of programs could the U.S. government do to strengthen democratic institutions and specifically in Congress in the Mexican Congress? And, and through partisanship, what would be successful in the long run through this six year that we're funding? Thank you. Right here, and then we'll finish with Dolia. Okay. Oops, sorry. So I'm curious, Claudia, who grew up as a traditional Jewish family. What will her relations be? With no, she didn't. She, I'm sorry, she, I got to stop you there. She, she, she did not. She is the daughter of, of, of strong communists who did not believe in religion they, they and were did atheists. not raise her with religion. So she is Jewish, that is clear, but she was not raised in a, in a traditional Jewish household. Okay, thanks. So, uh, may you book Kelly from also the you know, his dad is from Philistine, So, do you think there will be some back and forth? Between and also Carlos Lim in some Lebanese kind of, you know, uh, background. Uh, you know, what do you think with Israel and Lebanon having a tussle? Do you think there will be something, some, some takes if you can give, if possible? Thank you. Dolia? I have a very quick question from Dolia Stavis on the reporter here in Washington. Uh, the Supreme Court will soon address the, the big uh, case of the. Uh, arms trafficking that the previous administration had brought and completely brought to the courts. Uh, today, uh, the, the new 
foreign minister put it as a big success of foreign policy and to the extent that it's now in the Supreme Court. Uh, do you consider a foreign policy success that is now in the Supreme Court and what do you think? We couldn't hear your... That's okay. Well, I, yeah, I, I, I got we'll it. We'll repeat it, it up yeah. here. What impact would it have in the real world in terms of trying to review the young so the first question, Heidi, I think it was on U.S. Um, government policies or programs that could help democratic building in Mexico. Um, who would like to, to take that one? I will try to go very fast okay. on the three. Thank you. First, the current Claudia Sheinbaum government is not weak, is divided, which is different of being weak. It's quite a strong, but it's divided. Can we expect a Dilma 2.0 with Claudia? No. I don't think so. I think she will be a very strong president, and, uh, and, and she will take her time, and we'll see. Second, I don't think that the Mexico's position on Israel and Lebanon has to do with personalities, as Claudia Sheinbaum or Nayib Bukele or Carlos Slim. In any case, it has to do with the strength of the Jewish communities in Mexico and the Lebanese communities, and the traditional Mexico foreign policy. So. We have, um, uh, I mean, we have tried to to be neutral and and be and have been criticized for that because we were not uh, strong enough in condemning Hamas attack. But at the same time, we cannot support what Israel has been doing in Gaza with the bombs of two thousand pounds and so many children and innocents killed in, in Gaza. So I think Mexico will continue to do this, this neutral. And on the Supreme Court, I don't think that the, the consideration of the Supreme Court uh, of the issue of arms trafficking is a big success. It was brought to the Supreme Court by the arms producers. So, and it was brought to the Supreme Court according to my understanding, and I might be wrong, to kill it once and for all. Because once the Supreme Court says, no, this is not going to be considered, they will kill any other chance of starting a process in any other court. And this, I think, I personally think this is not well understood in Mexico. But of course, it's a, it's a media success to say that it has been a foreign policy success. I try to be very short on the Thank three. You. I just want to, on the first issue, Heidi, I think, I can't think of anything more difficult right now in the bilateral relationship than the U.S. attempting to do democracy or congressional training in, in Mexico. It, it's a mixed bag anywhere, but I think it would be, frankly, it would not be a wise use of resources right now in Mexico because I think it would actually raise mm -hmm. more concerns than it would resolve. On the defense. Any other thoughts? On, on the issue of the Supreme Court, um, I, I, I agree the, the sort of the, there's, a, there's a wrong narrative in Mexico. This, this has come to the Supreme Court because it's the gun manufacturers that have, uh, not knowing what the ideological lineup of the Supreme Court is today, this is the best way to kill the issue. Um, and. Uh, ensure that uh, sort of enshrine the principle of no liability mm -hmm. by gun manufacturers. I always argued, and in fact, this is a decision that was being bandied about when I was ambassador. The same proposal came up that we sue gun manufacturers, and my, my, my spin was, that's the wrong tack. What Mexico should be doing is not suing gun manufacturers. What Mexico should be doing is suing gun shops using guns successfully traced by Mexican and U.S. authorities that have been used to kill a police officer, a member of the armed forces, and you create 50, 60, 70 cases against specific gun shops with name, with an owner, and that's how you go about sort of trying to make an impact on the running of guns to the border with Mexico. It's not going after the gun manufacturers. Thank you so much. We're unfortunately out of time, but I want to take this opportunity to thank all the ambassadors for joining us this afternoon. It's only a pleasure to have you here and to learn from all of you.
And on behalf of the Mexico Institute, I'd just like to plug in um, one uh, piece of, or one item that we're working on that I think fits perfectly into the conversation that we had today. Um, last December, the Mexico Institute published a booklet for Mexico's next president with key policy uh, recommendations for Mexico's next leader. We are doing the same, but now for the next U.S. president and that booklet on what it should do, the next president should do with uh, Mexico, um, and that booklet will be published um, towards the end of November, early December, so we will be having, um, obviously, an event on that, um, and so look forward to that. And again, thank you, thank you, thank you to all of you for being here, and thank you all for coming, and to those online, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.